This is Larry Harnish with another Steve Hodell reaction video. Steve generally says the same thing, often word for word, even the same joke. I can see his lines coming a mile off, but at the same time, he slowly alters his narrative to fit new clues because Steve realizes his case is weak and flimsy and he is always finding new clues. The host is Alan Campbell, who has a weekly podcast called Watching America, which has zero rankings and very few reviews. He is on the adjunct instructional faculty at Old Dominion University. Rate My Professors calls him an entertaining, popular professor and an easy A. Will Alan Campbell be another unskeptical host asking softball questions? I'm guessing he will be. Now, Steve rambles in interviews, and when asked a question, he quickly detours into a recitation of his boilerplate about his remarkable father at every opportunity. So we'll see if Alan Campbell can keep him on track. I am not optimistic. As always, I haven't previewed this podcast because it's more fun that way, and I don't have to sit through it twice. This runs about 50 minutes, so with my snark, that should take it to two hours. If you get to the end, you deserve a gold star. But don't blame me. Blame Steve Hodell for lying so much. And let's share the screen. Alan, Dr. Alan Campbell, Watching America, Black Dahlia, Murder as a Fine Art. And reminder, if there's music, I'm going to talk over it so I don't get a copyright strike. And away we go. Blah, 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 blah. In the blah. golden days of Hollywood, many people hoped to find fame by having their face featured on the cover of major publications. Tragically, one woman achieved it posthumously. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Here we are going to the starstruck young girl from some little town comes to bad, big bad Hollywood and gets murdered, achieving in death the fame that she wanted all her life. Well, Alan Campbell, so far I am not optimistic. Her name was Elizabeth Short, and she would be called the Black Dahlia. Ooh. Her killer would go unpunished, Ooh. but some say not undetected. I'm Dr. Alan Campbell, and this is Watching America. Oh my life. Well, okay, talking over the music to not get a copyright strike. La 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 la, la blah 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 blah. Talk over the music. Rock out, rock out. Oh please. Oh, okay. Thank you. Today's conversation includes graphic content that mm. is not suitable for all listeners. Uh. From WHRV Norfolk, this is Watching America. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Uh, are we? Let's get. Oh come on, man. Oh please. Oh come on. Ah, uh, why are we doing this? Yes, we have heard people sing Hooray for Hollywood. Yes, we have. But perhaps there should also be a chorus of Hooray for Persevering Detectives. Oh! Uh, no, 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 no. Blah, 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 blah. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome to Watching America, Steve Hoda. Oh, people are such suckers for a British accent. Let's see what we have with Steve Hodel. Oh. Steve Hodel is the author of numerous books, including The Black Dahlia Avenger in 2003, his initial publication. Then he followed that in 2009 with Most Evil, and then The Black... And then Super Evil, and then Super de Duper Evil, and uh, there is a play, there is not a rock opera, uh, there is not a book of haiku, uh, there is not children's letters to the Black Dolly Avenger, there is not a screenplay for Black Dolly Avenger meets Son of Frankenstein. I, th that's all satire, okay? Dahlia, 
2 in 2012, then Most Evil 2 in 2015. His latest book is In the Mesquite, 2019 publication, which is an examination. Now, this is strange because this supposedly is from 2013, and yet uh, this refers to In the Weeds, uh, the 2019 book about even more crimes of George Hodel. Uh, every unsolved murder on the planet, George Hodel did it. And even some of the ones that have been solved, they weren't really solved. George Hodel did those too. Okay. Of, of his pursuit of solving the 1938 West Texas kidnap torture. So oh, torture. Oh, the torture. In short, the murders of Hazel and Nancy Frome. But before we get there, I want to get to the beginning. I want to talk about, well, a little boy. Born. Let's talk about a little boy. On to George and Dorothy Hodel, named Steve. What are some of your earliest recollections in a home that would eventually become, in its own right, rather infamous? Yes. Yes, the, the home where Steve didn't really live. Uh, he just says he lived there. Uh, his folks were estranged, and most of the time he was kicking around L.A. with his mom. Um, is he going to say we were the little princes and everything was going swimmingly? Let's see. Uh, well, let's see. To begin with, uh, I was born at Queen of Angels in Los Angeles, about two miles from that famous uh, Soden home that Dad would buy. I was... Okay, no. Dad didn't buy the Soden house. Uh, that was owned by George Hodel Sr. and George Hodel Jr., uh, Steve's dad, rented that house. It had been a rental. Uh, you look at the history of that house, and there had been lots and lots of people through there. It was a rental. So, no, he never owned it. And uh, the, the house that you see it today is after a million-plus dollar renovation and remodeling. That's not how it looked in the 1940s. basically lived there with my parents from age zero to nine. Okay, so Steve was born in 1941, and so age nine would be 1949. Um, no, that didn't happen. Uh, that's already a lie. Uh, Steve, as I said, was living with his mom. His folks were estranged. The mom kicked around LA. Um, there were times when she couldn't find a place to live. And so she and the three boys, uh, Steve and his two brothers would show up back at the house. Uh, but it was not, it was, it was kind of a tense time. And also she used it as a mail drop. Um, she didn't have a fixed address and she was, Steve's mom was a drunk and ended up going to jail for child neglect, for neglecting Steve and his brothers. That's the real story. You are not going to get that from Steve Hodel. He's going to tell you that he lived at the Soudan house and mom and dad were throwing parties for the Hollywood elite. Probably. That's what he usually says. My dad fled the country in 1950, so born in 41. Yeah, no, that didn't happen either. Uh, George Hodel's reputation was so trash after a trial, even though he was found not guilty, they had to go all the way to Hawaii to get a job. Um, uh, and I was there till 50. And uh, very positive uh, memories of, uh, you know, to me it was... Uh, Wait a minute. Positive memories. Positive memories. Did you hear him say that? Positive memories. Let's go back. Age zero to nine, when dad fled the country in 1950. So born in 41, uh, and I was there till 50. And uh, very positive uh, memories of, uh, you know, it, to me it was. Now that's interesting because in more recent interviews, he says he doesn't remember that time period at all. Um, so it's it's curious that now he says he has, or now he says, or in this one, he says he has positive memories. I don't know. As I said, Steve Hodel will change his story. Um, wow. Okay. Uh, this very unusual Mayan temple, of course, it was like a, a Hollywood set, if you would. And um, my mother was this very beautiful screenwriter. Uh, Steve's mom had been married to John Houston, and they, they divorced. And uh, her second husband was George Hodel. And um, as I said, they split up. And um, 
she was not living it there. Stephen is Stephen, his mom and his bros were not living there. Uh, sort of an actress. Uh, as a young girl, she did some acting, and uh, dad was this powerful medical doctor. No, he wasn't powerful. This, this is Steve World Fantasy. George Hodel was a public health doctor um, who whose patients were uh, poor blacks who had fled uh, uh, racism in the South and were living in what had been Little Tokyo, because LA was a segregated city during World War II. That's who his patients were really, not the Hollywood elite at all. Handsome, lots of parties, cocktail parties. Oh, mom and dad were throwing parties. No, that didn't happen either. You go through the society columns of the local papers and there isn't a single mention of Mr. and Mrs. Hodel throwing a single party, not one. Um, and this very unusual home to be living in. It was, uh, it was fantasy for me, it was... It... Every so often, Steve Hodel has a moment of self-knowledge. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. It was just magic time. Lots of uh, positive memories of uh, people laughing and drinking and cocktail parties. and Yeah, see, later on, Steve says he doesn't remember any of this. He has no memory of that period. Ugh. This man, he lies all the time. He lies about everything. Uh, my two brothers, I had, uh, there were three sons. So I had an older brother, Michael, and a younger brother, Kelvin, and the three of us would uh, hang out and... There were the three princes. Everything was going swimmingly. And one day there was a knock on the door. In the courtyard and watch the people. And it was just a, a great time until suddenly in 1949. <laughs> now, okay, this is not what happened. Steve Hodel's parents were estranged he and his brothers were living with the mom. She was neglecting them and eventually went to jail for child neglect. So none of this is true. What you just heard is total Steve Hodel bullshit. Uh, the lights went out and dad was gone and we were suddenly out and about and off on our own new, new uh, adventure with mom. Wait a, a great time until Suddenly, in 1949, uh, the lights went out and dad was gone and we were suddenly out and about and off on our own new, new uh, adventure with mom. Now, isn't it interesting that Steve Hodale fails to mention, oh, for a bunch of 1946, dad was in China. Does he mention that? No. Why not? You know, it's just, ah. Uh. And dad went to the Philippines, is that correct? Yes, dad, dad went far away to the Philippines. He married a rich Filipino lady. He did. Well, initially dad went to uh, Hawaii, which was still a territory back then. Mm. That's true. And he was there a couple of years. Yeah, uh, he was. Uh, he was got his. Did I hear a little laugh there? One of Steve Hodel's weird, inappropriate laughs, or weird, strange laughs? In psychiatry, he was working at the prison system there, counseling the criminally insane for a, a year. Yeah, I'm not sure any of that's true. Um, excuse me. Let me silence my phone here. That's probably. Uh, is that Steve Hodel calling in to complain about my making fun of him? It's probably the Steve Hodel butthurt hotline. Sorry. Or so. And then he would uh, <laughs> meet and. Uh... Yeah, I don't think, I'm not sure that the criminally insane thing is true. I think it was just a clinic. I have, in fact, checked that part of Steve's story. It is humanly impossible for one person to fact check Steve Hodel on everything. He lies all the time. Mary, uh, a young Filipino woman, Hortensia, came from a very wealthy, uh, connected family in Manila. And they would have a, a daughter there and then they would go on to Manila and uh, have three more children with her. 
that marriage would break up after about four or five years. Yeah, and let me point out that the Philippine branch of the family hate Steve Hodel for the allegations in Black Dolly Avenger. They absolutely hate his guts. Interestingly enough, Steve Hodel will not tell you that either. I wonder why. One of the things I wanted to ask you is about your dad, George, in relation to his attraction initially to Dorothy. Uh, as you've declared, Dorothy was a screenwriter. She was also... Uh... Yeah, she was, you know, kind of an aspiring screenwriter. I'm not sure she ever sold a screenplay. She did try to write. She did suggest uh, screenplay ideas to John Houston, which I think he pretty much ignored. Uh, there are a lot of letters between uh, from Dorothy Hodell to her former husband, John Houston, at the Motion Picture Academy. Mostly she's asking for money. Um, every so often, uh, she will suggest some off the wall idea. I think she sold a radio play. Remember that this was in the era before television and radio was big. And I think she sold a, a radio script, maybe like one, but an accomplished, a, an accomplished uh, a screenplay writer? Nah. Mm -mm. An actress aspiring of a sort? Uh, she was more of a screenwriter, an intellectual, um, and of course she married very young, and uh, there's a story there, of course, um, going back to the uh, 20s. Uh, let's see. Uh, George O'Dell and John Houston were allegedly double dating, and then they switched, and John Houston took off with Dorothy, and they got married. And then they split up, and she hooked up with George. I think that's the part. I think that's where we're gonna uh, come here. But jo Steve hasn't gotten into uh, what a remarkable man his dad is, and and playing uh, concerts at Shrine Auditorium. And we're five minutes into the podcast, and we haven't hit that point yet. Hmm. So she was uh, actually double dating with uh, George, my father, George Hodell. Uh, was uh, good friends with John Houston, who... Uh, yeah, we don't even know that's for sure. Steve would like that to be true, but yeah. John Houston and, and Steve's mom remained close. That's that's true. That part of it's true. Well, eventually become a very famous film director. Yes, of course. Yes, but back yes. then, of course, he was his fame was he was the son of Walter Houston, who was a stage and screen actor of, of a very quite prominent his father. So he was just a, a young 18-year-old uh, son of Walter, but dad and George and John double dated. Maybe they did. I Again, I haven't checked all of that. Uh, Steve, That is Steve's story. And they were double dating Emma Leo, who was a attractive young woman working at the downtown LA library, which had just been built. Yeah, I'm not sure about that either. Um, this is, I hadn't heard this information before. This is not something that Steve Hodell says later on. Um, okay. And Dorothy, who was an uh, 18 uh, year old, uh, very beautiful young woman. So as it started out, George started dating Dorothy and John started dating Emilia. And then after a couple of weeks, two or three weeks, they switched. <laughs> and John and Dorothy <laughs> fell in love. Uh, off they went, uh, they, they went to New York. They got married. They eloped to Greenwich Village. That, that part of the story is true. And so my future mother, Dorothy, uh, would be married. Why is he laughing? It's so weird. To John for seven years. Uh, they'd be living in New York, and they'd come back to Los Angeles. Well, Steve, I have a very limited repertoire for imitations, but I do do a, a, a reasonably good John Houston. Oh, goes... oh, please. Please, is that necessary? Like this. I was with Kate Hepburn, went to a little island off the coast of California called Catalina. Bobby was there. <laughs> he had this <laughs> wonderful ability to extend the ends of words. So, um, he did. Uh, had it not been... Alan, uh, I think you need to work on your uh, John Houston impersonation just a little bit, you know. God, these people and their 
freaking podcast. For the switch around, um, it would have been a very different scenario, and you, perhaps your last name would have been Houston. Well, George is your daddy, and um, you find some rather disturbing things early on in your life. I'm going to head right to the, the key crux of everything. Oh, let's go to the crux of everything. A 22-year-old Elizabeth Short was found mutilated, dead, cut in half. Uh, she is now... Yes, uh, yes, she is found dead, mutilated, cut in half, yes, okay. As the Black Dahlia, it was the Black Dahlia murder, it happened January the 15th, 1947. And she was found in an empty lot, albeit not that far from where you, your mum, and your brothers resided. No, that's not true. Um, no, no, because Steve and Mum and his brothers were not living in the Soden house. So sorry. Um, that would have been sufficient unto itself had you not chosen the career that you did. For and in fact, Steve Hodell in some of his other interviews says, well, 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 well yeah, we were living at the Soden house, but um, that, that week we were, we were visiting relatives. We weren't there. Yeah. Over 24 years, you were in the LAPD. You were a homicide detective. You 300, uh, 300 solves. Handled over 300 cases. I can see these lines coming a mile away. And you had evidently become aware of, of this uh, case uh, because it was it was not solved. It was left, you know, open still not no one really knowing what to do or what to make of it it kind of grew cold over the decades it grew cold yes your father dies you go through his materials you find uh, an intriguing box you open it and sort sorting through the belongings you see a series of curious pictures now hang on a second dr ellen campbell because that's not steve's story steve's story is that his dad died and his stepmother gives him this photo album uh, at least that's the generally accepted way of, that it goes. Um, okay, well this is this is interesting. All right, let's see what we're, let's see where we go from here. It's always an adventure. And it occurs to you that one of the pictures depicts a woman who looks amazingly Amazing. like the Black Dahlia. Oh, Doctor Campbell, you've got this all screwed up. It's two women. It's two pictures. Two women. Steve says they are the same woman, and these two pictures that are two different women, but the same women, are also the Black Dahlia. Got that? And of course, Elizabeth Short's family says, that's not her. Uh, and Steve says, yes, it is. It doesn't matter. German recognition software, German facial recognition software, harm for harm. All right, Dr. Campbell. Let's go. Take it from there, Steve. So I spent uh, 23 years with LAPD, 17 as a homicide detective, and as you say, 300 murders. Then I retired uh, in 86 and, uh, and left Los Angeles for Washington with his kids. Started a whole new life, moved up to Seattle, uh, north of Seattle to Bellingham, Washington. Had my young sons, I had two sons, and uh, was raising them there. And my father relocated after being absent for several decades, oh, well, actually, since 1950, decided to come back to the U.S., came, returned and relocated to San Francisco. Now, is Steve going to say that his dad lived in the penthouse of this uh, apartment building that had a view of uh, the cemetery where Elizabeth Short was buried? Is he going to say that? Hmm. Because that's what he usually says. Let's see. So we had been estranged, although I had seen him through the years. And uh, we... oh, this is new information. Usually, Steve says, "I didn't know my father. We were very close." We hooked back up and became very close. Ah, so in okay. That last decade of his life, uh, I got to see him on a regular basis and stuff. He dies of a heart attack at age ninety-one, and as you say, I'm, I'm call down to uh... okay now i happen to have george hodell's death certificate right here it does say 
he died of a heart attack or a, let's see, where is it here? Uh, he died of congestive heart failure. George O'Dell died of congestive heart failure and ischemic cardiomyopathy. But Steve Hodell often says, oh, well, no, 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 he actually overdosed and committed suicide. So let's see if he goes, goes to that place. Uh, by his wife, June, said, you know, help her take care of all the things you have to do when a father passes. And she's, we're sitting there. Yeah, and you know, Steve wasn't the executor of his dad's estate anyway. We have the paperwork, that's not what happened. Okay. We're talking about the great man's passing and what a remarkable life he had. My remarkable father. And she brings out this small album with his photograph, as you mentioned. And uh, Man Ray was the family photographer, sort of like Olin Mills, but for the Hodells. I'm going through the album and I, it's got photos of my mother and, and us boys taken by Man Ray. Now, it's interesting. He's, you hear where he says the photographs were taken by Man Ray. In some places, he'll say that all the photographs were taken by his dad. It, it is just, it, it is uh, minds, it, it, it will just snap your head around trying to keep up with what Steve Hodell says. It was a famous surrealist artist. Oh, and, the uh, surrealist, awful, the awful. He's actually a, our family photographer. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Olin Mills for the Hodells, sure. When I come across this photo of this dark haired young woman and I said to June, who is this? She's like, oh, that's interesting. There are two photographs of women and Steve's original claim. Let's see if I can find it. Let's see if I can find, quickly find that photograph. Um, Steve's original claim is that the, uh, that there are, uh, let's see, Steve's original claim. Where are we here? was that there are, ah, here we are. Steve's original claim, there it is. There are two pictures. And Steve originally said, both these women are Elizabeth Short. One of them came forward and said, no, that's that's not Elizabeth Short, that's me. And so Steve had to retract his, his story and say, oh, well, there's one photograph now that's Elizabeth Short. Um, and he never said I had it wrong. You'll never, Steve Hodell never says, oh, I had it wrong, I screwed up. That's, uh, that's not how Steve Hodell rolls. So it's down to one photograph, um, which he says is Elizabeth Short and is not. So I don't know, somebody your father knew from a long time ago. And it looked vaguely familiar. Well, I had had no, in, no investigation, no contact with the crime itself. Which are... Except for they showed the pictures at the police academy. And let me point out, those photographs were not in general circulation in 1963 when Steve Hodell joined the police department. Those were those pictures were hard to see. They were not in general circulation. Um, heard in 47. I came on in 63, and I was dealing with the present, the future, not the past. I'd heard about it as a famous unsolved. You know, it was one of probably the most famous unsolved LAPD had and I went through the academy I saw uh, photographs of it so he did know something about it it wasn't just oh I never heard of it I, I heard about the crime and I saw the pictures which if you have seen them you will not forget them let me tell you they mentioned but that was it I didn't even know her name oh my god I didn't know her name therefore you know uh, everything happens to Steve you notice that Nothing happens to anybody else. It all happens to Steve. I didn't know her name. It's all about her. It's all about his journey. Nothing to do with Elizabeth Short at all. So anyway, I look at this, and for some reason, Black Dahlia comes to mind. At I wonder why that is. Does he hear the cash registers ringing? Oh, I can turn this into some money? Yeah, that's what happened. And to this day, I can't exactly explain it all the 
Yeah, I think he he's going to say that there was this TV movie in in the seventies called Who Is the Black Dahlia, and he had seen that, but he never heard of the Black Dahlia case. He just um, saw the pictures, heard about it at the police academy, and watched this TV movie. But yeah, he'd never heard of it. Yeah. Oh, it may have been there was a movie made in the mid seventies with Ephraim Ziblis Jr. and mm -hmm. uh, Lucy Arnaz about the Black Dahlia. So it. Yeah. And so this photograph that I saw that was, you know, taken by Man Ray or my dad or someone conveniently uh, reminded me of, uh, 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 well, not the Black Dahlia, but Lucy Arnaz playing, portraying the Black Dahlia, right? Because, I mean, that's what he's saying in essence. And it was a spitting image, so it might have been that. The spitting image of... Lucy Arnaz is what you're saying, Steve. It's not saying you're the spitting image of, uh, you saw the spitting image of Elizabeth Short. It was the spitting image of Lucy Arnaz. But anyway, it just came and went. Uh, fast forward, I'm, a day later, I'm talking to my half sister. Oh, Tamar, what the hell are you talking about? On the telephone, she's in Hawaii and we're talking about our same father talking about his passing and what a remarkable life. Yeah. She said that uh, George Hodel molested her, and, and but suddenly she is waxing about, you know, oh, this remarkable man who molested me. Yeah, I don't think so, Steve. I, that just doesn't, that's a stretch. That is a stretch. And she comes out and she says, well, you know, he was a suspect in the Black Dahlia murder. Tamar, what the hell are you talking about? I'm saying, what are you talking about, Tim? Ah! <laughs> or, I said, where in the hell is this coming from? Bingo. Well, half sister, but we had I had maybe a half hour of communications in 50 years with her. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And that includes when he wrote Black Dolly Avenger. Steve wrote Black Dolly Avenger in total secrecy. He didn't tell anybody exactly what he was working on. And several members of the Hodel family, including Tamar, were pretty darn upset when the book came out. Uh, Steve found a way to calm down Tamar uh, from being upset. Uh, I won't get into how he managed to calm her down, but he did calm her down. And uh, we had never had any real contact. So I, I said, well, that's ridiculous. I said, you know, she says, well, he was a suspect. He didn't do it, but that... I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, with my experience as a detective, I can clear him immediately. And, of course, George Hodel had already been cleared uh, years and years earlier. Uh, he had been eliminated as a suspect. But Steve's going to go on to on this mission to exonerate his dad, but actually his dad, because that's where... Bring in those dollars, baby. Bring them in. Make that money. Shake that money maker, Steve. So where is this coming from? She says, well, the LAPD detectives told me this uh, during the trial. And there was a... Oh, that's interesting. Now, Steve's story is usually that she heard it from the cops who were transporting her. Uh, and let me point out that, because you'll never hear it from Steve, uh, Tamar was a juvenile. There are protocols for transporting juveniles. You don't treat them like adults uh, at all. So, yeah, and we know we know that they took those precautions with Tamar because she was a juvenile. Trial, a dad was arrested back in 49 for incest, where he was actually tried and uh, found not guilty. He got Jerry Geisler, who was like... No. Again, Jerry Geisler, uh, George Hodel got another attorney in Jerry Geisler's office. Jerry Geisler was indeed a very famous a defense attorney of that period. Let me point out that if you are accused of a crime, you want a good lawyer. That is your right as a defendant. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and well, let's see how what how much Steve talks about the trial. The Johnny Cochran of that day. He uh, said with we, whom, may I ask, his daughter or? or? Yes, with Tamar. With well, Tamar. With my half sister. Yeah, she was. She was. Uh, seven years older than I, and she was living with us at the this Franklin. No, no, she was not living with them at the Franklin house. 
she was living at the Franklin house, but Steve and his brothers and mom, his mom were not there. They were kicking around LA. What happened was Tamar was a problem child from her early, early years. And the mom got fed up with trying to deal with her. It's just, I can't control this kid anymore. She's given me nothing but problems. I'm going to ship you down to LA and you can live with your dad. So Tamar gets sent down to Los Angeles. Well, she doesn't want to be in LA living with her dad. George is living the bachelor lifestyle. He and and no, Steve and his brothers and his mom are not living there. Uh, George is living the single lifestyle. He doesn't want this incorrigible teenage daughter anywhere around. Do you think it went well? No, it didn't go around. It didn't go at all well. And what happened was Tamar told Steve's half brother Duncan before she went down there, I'm going to make up allegations that dad molested me. It won't be true, but the cops won't know that. And indeed, that's what she did. And she also, just to, just to up the ante a little bit, she also made the same allegations as 13 boys at Hollywood High School. So yeah, she was, it, it was uh, accusing boys, accusing men of molestation was a favorite pastime of Tamar Hodel. Soden House, the, the Smyon Temple. And in her in her attitude, did she absolve him from this crime, or, or did she? she no, 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 he did no. it. So he, so that's Alan. That's a good question. You asked, did she? You know, was she okay with that? No, she didn't. And yet she was talking about how remarkable he was. That's actually not bad, Alan. Not bad. Oh, there was no question about. There were three adults present during the actual sex act, so it was it was a dunk, slam dunk case. But it was not a slam dunk case um, at all. Uh, it, let me point out very briefly that the witnesses called in that trial included Tamar's mother, who said she was a liar and wouldn't believe her under oath. Tamar's grandmother, who said. Tamar is a liar, and I wouldn't believe her under oath. And about eight other women who all said, Tamar's a liar, we wouldn't believe her under oath. And let me also point out, because you will never, ever, ever hear it from Steve, the jury was primarily women, okay? The jury was either eight women and four men, or nine women and three men. And none of those women on the jury believed Tamar. So, no, it wasn't just, oh, he got a sharp attorney. Tamar was a liar. She was. And she she continued to be a liar for the rest of her life, a liar and manipulator. Uh, her kids say so. Everybody said so. The only person who does, doesn't say that Tamar is a liar is Steve. And I wonder why that is. You got to understand, L.A. back then was a real life L.A. confidential. No, it wasn't. No, no, no. A lot of corruption, a lot. No, no, no. A payoffs. No. And we would later find out, actually, would I once I would get into the secret files, we would actually discover there was actually a, pay, a payoff of fifteen thousand dollars. There was not. Nope. Were you aware? Of who was? And, and it's interesting. Who were you going to pay off? You going to pay off the jury because the jury found her not guilty. You know, I mean. It's hard to believe Steve knows anything at all about the legal system or the judicial system uh, because, and no, that that is not in the alleged secret files that Steve is talking about. None of this is true. It's all Steve Hodel bullshit. Was any aberrant, peculiar behavior of your dad at that point? No, no, I wasn't, you know, I was, you know, I would. I have no memory of this. He has, he has memories he doesn't remember. I don't know. Uh, at that point, I was eight years old, I and uh, so I just saw him as a larger than life, you know, mm -hmm. a large and in charge, uh, handsome. I was very proud of him. Erudite, clever man. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so after Tamar told me this, I said, "Well, that's this is ridiculous." I said, "With my experience, I can clear him in in uh, five minutes." Of course, that had been done uh, many many years before, but Steve is going to charge right into it. I knew he was good for the incest because he had an obsession with sex, which I would, you know, later discover in my adulthood. And, and I always believed Tamar, but 
Oh, he's the only one in the family who believes her. <laughs> no one else does. Nobody in the Hodel family believes Tamar, except Steve. Murder, you know, cold-blooded killing, a torture, kidnap, torture, murder, no way. So I said, I'll be able to exonerate him. And I'm going to follow the evidence. 10 seconds. Yeah, no, that was not Steve's plan at all. Steve was, uh, shake that money maker. And that's what I started out to do. I started. I followed the evidence. Case. I didn't even know the victim's name. At that time, I was divorced. This is where we're talking about 1999 now. So long retired, 13 years. I followed the evidence. Retired from LAPD. And I started looking into the case. My girlfriend was in LA. She was sending me up newspapers from that time period. The next thing that really jumped out at me was she sends me up the front page of uh, one of the local newspapers, the Times or uh, Examiner, I forget which. And on it was. <laughs> well, it wasn't the LA Times because the LA Times never ran the, the Black Dahlia story on the front page. So we can eliminate that. The, or only once when a guy named Joseph Dumay was suspected. That is the only time until my st I wrote my story in 1997. The killer in the Black Dahlia murder started taunting the police with notes, cut and paste notes like ransom type things and ha disguised handwriting. Well, it, I recognized my dad's handwriting. And this one that he sent in, it was undisguised and it, he had written a note saying, turning myself in on January 29th, had my son at the police signed it Black Dahlia Avenger. Yeah. Let me point out because you will never, ever, ever, ever hear it from Steve. Only one mailing was considered legitimate by the original investigating officers. That was the envelope that was addressed with cut out letters, uh, cut out headlines, and contained items from Elizabeth Short's purse. That is the only one that was legit. The, the, the rest were pranks and crackpots. And pranking the police, pranking the newspapers in the Black Dahlia case, was a thing. And it happened, not just in the Black Dahlia case, any big case, you were gonna get the crackpots and the pranksters uh, sending stuff to the police. It was very typical. It was, as weird as it sounds, a thing to do in Los Angeles in the 40s was, was to try to prank the police with crackpot mail. Happened all the time. Well, I looked at the handwriting and it's my father's handwriting. Mm. Steve's an ace at recognizing his dad's handwriting. He's really good at it. It's one of his favorite tools. I recognize my dad's handwriting. I mean, you know your parents' handwriting. Your listeners yes. know their parents' handwriting. Yes. And I knew his. He had a very unusual block printing type style. But I still said to myself, no way. There's just no way. Is he pretending to be the suspect? I followed the evidence. Like, what the hell is going on here? You know? And... Um, and then uh, did some digging in, and I discovered that the crime was committed by a surgeon, skilled surgeon, not a... Right, which George Hodel was not. George Hodel was not a skilled surgeon. This is part of the Steve World lore that his dad was this incredibly uh, distinguished surgeon who suddenly abandoned surgery and the surgical profession and became a public health doctor. Like, no, that is not how medicine works. And Steve Hodell relies on people's ignorance to sell that to, to sell that story. That's not how the medical profession works at all. Alan Campbell, are you going to catch him on that? I'm guessing no. He got her, the police had established that it's, it had to have been a skilled surgeon. Well, Dad, in his early doctoring, had been a surgeon at the in New Mexico and and at the CCC uh, Rosa. No, 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 no. That's not how the medical profession works. And, you know, let me point out that you're not going to have a, a surgeon at a logging camp, which is what he's talking about. You're going to have somebody that is going to be able to stabilize an injured individual and get them to uh, a facility that a hospital that has the ability to treat someone who is seriously injured. Otherwise, it's going to be first aid, you know, splinters, maybe setting a broken bone something like that that's that is what you're going to have this is totally crazy I felt camps but still i said there's no way and at that point 
uh, I kind of decided, well, look, I, I can't do an absentee. I'm living in Bellingham. I can't do an absentee investigation. So I relocated back to L.A. and started a serious investigation. And I followed the evidence. Started talking to witnesses that were still alive. And Who did he talk to? Who did he talk to? Interesting. You know who he didn't talk to? He didn't talk to the LAPD. He never, ever, ever asked to see his father's LAPD file until after Shake That Moneymaker came out. Uh, if Steve Hodel had asked to see his dad's file before he wrote Shake That Moneymaker, they would have showed it to him. Now he'll never see it because he has uh, accused the LAPD of all kinds of cover-ups and whatnot. But no, he never asked to see it. That's what a diligent investigator Steve Hodel was. He didn't want the truth. He wanted to cobble together some bullshit scheme to con people and write a book. That's what it's all about. And doing heavy duty stuff. Let me ask you, Steve, uh, when you entertain the idea of furthering this investigation, and clearly with the with the murder being perpetrated murder. accidentally by somebody who was a surgeon, a la an echo, historical echo of Jack the Ripper. No, it isn't a historical echo of Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper wasn't a fucking surgeon, you stupid shit. Dr. Alan Campbell, I'm not impressed. Uh, what? made you want to pursue this? I mean, wasn't there a part of you that were, was repulsed by the idea of, well, part of the origin of your... No, because he might sell books and make money. Are you kidding? That's what it's all about. DNA belonging to a murderer. I mean, what gave you the incentive to keep going? No, it was just the opposite. I was absolutely convinced that he had nothing to do with it. Yeah, no. Shake that money maker. Shake that money maker. That was Steve Hodel's motivation. I and I would be able to establish and exonerate him oh. and, and clear his name. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, have any suspicion. Got you. My mistake was. But that. The, oh, he's going to say I followed the evidence. In following the evidence. Oh, let's hear that again. No, it was just the opposite. I was absolutely convinced that he had nothing to do with it. I and I would be able to establish and exonerate him ah. and clear his name and, and, you know, have any suspicion. Got you. My mistake was in following the evidence. Ah! Bingo. Okay. He didn't follow the evidence. He made up the evidence. See, George Hodel had been cleared years and years before. It had been forgotten. Nobody knew about it. There was absolutely no reason for Steve Hodel to dig it up except that he could shake that money maker. Ultimately, it would all come together in this massive case that actually leaves no doubt that he was actually, actually the killer. And the horror was, as I got it- It leaves lots of doubt. <laughs> Tons of doubt, oceans of doubt. To it, I discovered that it wasn't just the one Murder, was it? Murder is a fine art. He did. Steve is now up to 50 killings in 50 years. Just Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia. But it was a, he was a serial killer. What were the connecting factors? I mean, to, to designate somebody as a serial killer, there has to be something that is the thread that is typical oh, yeah. uh, well, of, of the uh, modus operandi, if you will. Yeah. Oh, the modus operandi. Um, is Steve Hodel going to talk about his thought prints, his magical, magical thought prints? Um, that he will recognize um, clues. He will recognize his dad's handwriting. He will recognize that a body is left near somewhere, uh, a street name. Uh, I call it map torture. Uh, a, a body will be left near a street to point to another street to another killing. Actually, uh... If you get if you get three or four um, crime signatures that look similar, mm -hmm. you're going to look at them. Well, ultimately, I would come up with 32 separate crime signatures, uh, which is unheard of, you know, as far as connecting him. But just some of the main ones, they weren't all 
the women, all the victims were not cut in half, but they were pulled. Yeah. <laughs> Big difference. Well, they weren't cut in half, but. Many of them were posed on vacant lots. No. No. Um, no, they weren't posed. They were, sad to say, they were dumped. Uh, only in Steve World were they posed. They were um, basically uh, tortured, overkill, you know, uh, clearly a classic sadist in the extreme. Were these victims, uh, was there evidence of sexual abuse in the process or was it just the killing alone? Both. Yeah, Both. Some were, some were not. So yeah, some were, some were not, depending on uh, Steve, how Steve Hodel can tie them all together and say, Daddy did it. Some were, some were there was actual, actual uh, uh, sexual assault and rape in some of them, and some not. Uh, so and so you're going to say they're all the same? Sure. Okay. More random, you know, just grabbed off the street. Others uh, were... Uh, Met it, you know, one of them he followed off a bus and, and, and all kinds of different ones, but it was a pretty tight geographical pattern. And actually, I <laughs> yeah, Steve Hodel's map is hilarious. He, uh, it, you know, it, it is the attack of the 100 foot lone woman. You know, the, the way he draws the map is he makes of, of LA, he makes it look like these murders all happened in a very small area. LA is enormous. LA is, is many, many, many square miles. These murders are spread all over the place in reality. But in Steve world, oh yeah, it's a tightly grouped area. Sure. I would discover once I got into the secret files that there were actually four or five of the ones that I came up with 12 and at least five of those were actively investigated uh, by LAPD and the DA's office is being connected. But yeah, these, th yeah. Not really. I mean, when, when when Steve's talking about the secret files, that's the district attorney's files. And for reasons that are I won't get into right now, uh, it the Black Dahlia case went before the grand jury. Grand jury proceedings are by law secret. Uh, you you they you know people it, it, it's public information who's being called uh, to testify, but what they say is secret. That's the whole point of the grand jury. So yeah, there's nothing nefarious about the secret files. Grand jury proceedings are secret. Um, and that, that's all about that. Steve has a lot of things that he says are in the secret files and they're not really there, you know, because he figures, well, the average person doesn't have access to this stuff. I'll just say it's in there and no one will know. And the files are a mess. So unless you read every, every slip of paper, you won't know that, oh, that's not there. What's he talking about? I've read every slip of paper. I know what's in there. I know he's lying. They didn't have the term serial killer back then, but they called them, what was it they called them? They called chain, them- uh, Chain murders, chain murders. Uh, chain killings. The yeah. vacant lot aspect uh, is intriguing. Uh, yes. What's with the propensity for, I mean, I would think that if- Vacant lots are a good place to leave bodies, uh, Alan, uh, generally. Someone had such nefarious evil intent, the very last place you'd want to be perpetrating these cutting up sessions and deboweling people one presumes and what have you, it would be in an open lot. Uh, well, Alan, people were killed, at least in Elizabeth Short's case, she was killed elsewhere and put on at the crime, left at the crime scene. Um, not all of them, not all of the victims uh, were that way, were, were that way some were they were just found where they were killed not in elizabeth short's case how does that figure with the psyche of the perpetrator well for, for example with the black dahlia crime she wasn't murdered at the open lot she was murdered at the at our home the frank no she wasn't murdered at this <laughs> no 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 nobody knows where she was killed the house the soden house no. Wow. In, you, in your home is the yes. place. Yes. No. No. Utter bullshit. That's total a total lie. And if you press Steve, he'll say, uh, uh, "Well, we weren't living there that week. We we were uh, we were visiting relatives or cousins or friends or something. We weren't there." And uh, you know, 
maybe I, I don't know if you you, you kind of have to understand he's and he's he's a remarkable man you have to understand my father this is how steve always gets out of questions that he doesn't want to answer he'll dodge into my father was a remarkable man and i think that's where he's going posing these bodies uh one of the main keys of linkage was street signs map torture map torture and let me point out that Steve Hodel stole this idea, as stupid as it is, um, he is going to say that Elizabeth Short's body was left on Norton Avenue as a pointer a couple blocks away to Degnan, uh, which referring to a murder the year before of a little girl in Chicago named Suzanne Degnan. As dumb as this idea is, S Steve Hodel stole it from this ridiculous crackpot site, and I will not tell you what the address of it is because it's still out there. Uh, he stole that. And Steve has lately gotten to saying that Elizabeth Short was left off Degnan rather than on Norton Avenue because it serves his purpose. Sometimes I've actually heard him say that Norton and Degnan are the same street, which is absurd. Um, well, let's see where he goes with this. Okay. Um, that, and that's why we kind of need to understand that. Dad is this remarkable man a little bit more to to understand what he's doing here born in la musical prodigy yeah he loves to get this is where steve hodell and the hosts never get it. you know steve will derail into i got to tell you about what a remarkable that uh man my dad was i, I and i think we're gonna he sounded like he was gonna go into the child prodigy story at age nine playing his own piano cut piano recitals at shrine auditorium concerts at the Shrine Auditorium. No, he played a he played a piano interlude during a day of boring speeches. That's what's really happened. Shrine Auditorium was a big barn with rotten acoustics. You would never do a piano recital in there. It's a joke. Sat th it seated thousands of people. At age fourteen, he's entering. He's graduated from high school. Doctor Campbell, you have just lost control of the interview. You have just let Steve walk away with it. And he's going to go into his boilerplate about his dad being uh, precocious. And, and uh, let's see, uh, what comes next? I think uh, one point higher than Einstein. Do I hear that? One point higher than Einstein? I've identified him as a high genius, 186 IQ, one point above Einstein. Yes. Now, okay. George O'Dell's was, did take IQ tests. His ISQ scores are online if you know where to look. He was part of the Terman uh, test. His IQ was more like 151. Certainly wasn't under 186. And it is ridiculous to say one point above Einstein because Einstein never took an IQ test. It was pure speculation. And it is, in my opinion, as a total layman, that an IQ test is utterly immaterial for an adult. It's for kids. It's for children. Uh, it's evaluating young people, um, and I, I won't get into more than that uh, unless I need to, uh, but it's just ridiculous. No. That skips a generation. Someone. Oh, he loves that joke. It skips a generation. Now, will Dr. Alan Campbell laugh? <laughs> My boys are in good shape, but goes to Caltech at 14 has an affair with a professor's wife. Oh, here was, here's the professor's wife. George, you're a child yourself. They named the daughter Folly. Wife, she gets pregnant. She breaks up her marriage. She goes east. Why is that funny? What's funny about that? What is funny about that? And, you know, what's really amusing uh, is that Steve Hodel doesn't even know if that story is true. He posted a thing on his blog. He's like, does anybody know if this is true? Was it really a professor? Maybe it was just one of his friends. Did she really name the daughter Folly? Isn't that a weird name for a, a girl? Um, and if you go through the census records trying to find a, a girl named Folly, you won't, there is like maybe one, uh, but not, not born anywhere that Steve Hodel says. I mean, you can't find this kid. You can't find this lady. It's just Steve Hodel bullshit. He follows her east at 15 and says, I want to. George, you're a child yourself. Raise the child. She says, George, you're a child yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, 
He is so predictable. On my life, she's laughing at him. Get go. He comes back. Um, he, then we have the situation with uh, Emilia. She gets pregnant. They go north. Pregnant. How does any of this? How does any of this answer Alan Campbell's question? Steve Hodell has just taken the interview and just gone off into his boilerplate about his dad. And it, uh, Berkeley goes across to U.S. at San Francisco, uh, gets his M.D. there, highly skilled amongst his many gifts. He's Everybody wanted him, blah, 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 blah. Surgeon, no. George Hodell had the minimum instruction in surgery to graduate from medical school. All the breakdown of hours that Steve Hodell says, yeah, everybody had that. That's what you had to have. That was the minimum to graduate from medical school. And that's all the training he had. That's it. No special training in surgery. The minimum to graduate from medical school, that's all. Got this amazing eye-hand coordination. His professors at, uh, at medical school are vying him to be their assistant because he's got this natural ability as a surgeon. Gets a job, goes to New Mexico and the Hopi Navajo reservations, becomes a soul cert. Yeah, you know what? The Hopi and Navajo reservations are different. The Hopis and the Navajo. Now, don't get me started on the Hopis and the Navajos, but no. ...of a logging camp, comes back to L.A., joins the health department, quickly rises to the... Yeah. He quickly rises to the head of the uh, communicable diseases and venereal disease department. Steve will eventually, if, if uh, Dr. Alan Campbell lets him ramble, will say that uh, George was head of the health department. He was not. He was never head of the health department. No, no, no. Top becomes the VD czar. He specializes in um, sexual uh, ailment. Yeah. Communicable diseases like VD. Yeah. There was a, a tremendous outbreak of VD at that, in that time period. Uh, shocking, I know, that the greatest generation was getting VD, but they were. Um, yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. becomes the VD czar of Los Angeles. VD diseases, yes. Uh, and then he, oh, he buys the Soden house. This no, 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 no. Didn't buy the Soden house. His dad owned the Soden house. Steve's grandfather owned the Soden house. It had been a rental. If you go through the history of the house, there were people in and out of there every couple of years. A, a theater company had been in there. He didn't buy it. He rented it. And that's why he took in boarders to help pay the rent. Mayan temple, uh, Mary's mom, uh, and then my brothers and I come along. Yeah, well, not quite. Not quite. Uh, Steve's older brother was born before the folks got married. And, you know, is that a big deal? It's only a big deal because Steve makes a stink about how uh, uh, George Hodel and uh, Duncan's mom were never married and implying that uh, Duncan was somehow illegitimate. A lot of bad blood in the Hodel family. Duncan Hodel, Steve's older half-brother, quit talking to him over what over what was said in uh, Black Dahlia Avenger. Shake that moneymaker. In the late 30s, early 40s, everything goes along fine until 49. He gets arrested on the incest. No, everything does not go along fine. Um, as I said, Steve and his brothers were living with the mom, kicking all over L.A. George was in China for a year, so it wasn't everything was just okie dokie fine. That is not at all what happened. That is, that is Steve Hodel bullshit. When Tamar is oh, is there a knock on the door? My half sister's visiting us, and he splits the country. He's about to be arrested. After the trial, he's acquitted, but they're going to arrest him on the on the uh, Dahlia crime. He splits the country, goes to Hawaii, he's in the wind. Yeah, what, what happened was, uh, even though George Hodel was found not guilty of uh, sexually abusing Tamar, she succeeded in trashing his reputation. He couldn't get hired anywhere. He had to go all the way to Hawaii to find somebody who would hire him. That's what really happened. Um, Tamar's allegations were all about revenge, and she got it. And that's what it's all about. 
you know, we would never have known this except for some secret files that my investigation ultimately would reveal. Secret files because grand jury investigations are secret. Yeah. Deal. So basically, I put it all together and I go to a district attorney in Los Angeles who's still active. Named Stephen K. Steve Hodiel goes to Stephen K. Stephen K. looks over Steve's evidence and says, based on this evidence, I would file against George Hodel and Elizabeth Short and Gene French murders. The Gene French was uh, kicked and stomped to death um, and beaten to death about a month later. Um, let me point out that Stephen K. no longer talks about the Black Dahlia case. Stephen K. no longer discusses Steve Hodel. The only thing that Stephen K. has gone on the record saying is that he doesn't believe Steve Hodel's allegations that there was an LAPD cover. So that's the reality. Let's see what Steve says. A guy named Steve K. who was a head district attorney. He, he actually prosecuted all the Manson cases with Lou Gliosi. Uh, he was co-counsel mm -hmm. and uh, he highly respected. I give him the present my case, give him my written investigation. He reviews it for six months and comes back and says, well, he says, this is, you know, basic, basically my review, I would file against George. Just about it. I'd file again, file against George in the uh, Elizabeth Short and the Gene French. I would love, I would love to get Steve Hodel on the witness stand. Boy, would I love that. Never happened. But I would love to do that. Dell on the Dahlia case, Elizabeth Short, and the second murder. Gene French. The Gene French that happened three weeks after. Nude body posed on a lot. She wasn't posed. She was dumped. Uh, what happened was uh, she was fighting with presumably a guy. Uh, he beat her with something like the handle of a socket wrench and stomped on her. She fell out of his car and he just stomped her. And what she died of was, uh, a, I believe, a rib broke and punctured her heart. And that's what killed her. Um, but there were heel marks all over that area. And they knew what shoe size the killer wore. And so I have a picture of the heel size of the killer. And they knew uh, that the killer had very small feet, unlike George Hodel, who had big feet. Will Steve tell you any of that? Oh no, Steve Hodel will never tell you that. He will, you will never hear any of that out of Steve Hodel. That's the truth. And he took lipstick and wrote on her body an obscenity F U uh, and signed it B D for Black Dahlia. Now, when you look at the photo of the body, and I've seen it probably on the internet somewhere at this point because most things are on the internet, it does look like it says fuck you bd uh the medical examiner the official reports uh say that what was written on the buddy was fuck you pd as in police department um i i you know that's what the reports say when you look at the photograph it's hard to see it saying that but these guys saw the body that was the that's in the report that's in the that's in the official reports fuck you pd so so he says, I'd file on those two and I'd win it in a jury trial. He says, I'd love to, I would so love to get Steve Hodel on the witness stand over some of this evidence. The other cases are very interesting. You're probably right, but not quite enough to cross the threshold for filing. Let me just remind everyone listening that this is Watching America. I'm your host, Dr. Alan Campbell, and we are speaking with Steve Hodel, who <sighs> discovered. Who discovered that his father indeed was a monster. But no, he didn't discover that. He made that up and wrote about it in Shake That Money Maker and more Shake That Money Maker and still more Shake That Money Maker. That's the, that's the reality. It's all about selling books and getting on TV. That's it. It's all of it. Believed to be the perpetrator of the murder of the Black Dahlia. In 1947, January the 15th thereof, a body was found of a female mutilated, cut apart, torn apart, 
of a 22 year old woman aspiring actress by the name of oh here we go with the trope again of elizabeth short now steve hodell for 24 years worked for the lapd department he became uh, one of the best homicide detectives handling over 300 cases yeah no steve hodell was according to his fellow homicide detectives uh, was quote direct quote an okay detective with a drinking problem he was no great shakes he was nothing special okay detective with a drinking problem that's what his fellow homicide detectives say about him then now they think he's a joke steve hodell is a total pariah within the lapd they just laugh about him they just laugh about him and moreover retired and then became a private investigator and in the process hit upon a bizarre and disturbing discovery amongst his deceased father's possessions a picture of a woman looking amazingly like the black dahlia she looks nothing like the black dahlia only in only in steve world does that picture look like the black dahlia not in reality and this ensued with him getting back to los angeles to investigate the circumstances and concluding as did the assistant district attorney as we've just heard that this indeed was the connection his father was the murderer and perpetrator of not only the death of elizabeth short the black dahlia but also of many other women oh yes yes dr campbell george hodell killed 50 people in one a year for 50 years he was a jet set serial killer he flew around the world killing people here there everywhere um it's amazing he had any time to be a doctor because he was killing so many people right no never killed anybody it's all about shake that money maker and now sir steve we will continue uh from where we've just spoken okay so basically with that i said okay uh you know uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and write it up as a as a book as a true crime story and, and reveal it are you going to go to the lapd and ask to see your dad's file steve hmm? Hmm? and i did and just before the publication i went to a top la columnist a newspaper guy for the la times named steve lopez and uh he jumped into it and uh went to lapd and said hey there's this guy steve hodell gave steve lopez a copy of black dolly avenger this is i've been calling it shake your money maker this is the book that steve hodell gave to steve lopez steve lopez gave it to me he said what do you think i said steve this is the equivalent of seeing the face of jesus on a tortilla which was in steve lopez's column do you think steve hodell will ever say that no will steve hodell tell you that the publicist said the one person in the world we don't want to see that book is larry harnish oh yeah because that's what really happened now he won't tell you any of that no 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 hotel he, he uh says his father's the black dahlia killer yada 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 and the lapd basically says go away we don't talk about unsolved cases they don't so he goes to the head to the actual da stephen cooley and says hey hotel and black dahlia blah, blah, blah. and the da says well i'm not spending a dime of taxpayers money on a 60 year old case but he says you know there's a f box a, a file in the vault on the black dahlia would you like to see that Hello. yeah okay again grand jury proceedings are by law secret and it wasn't one box it was several boxes how do i know because i have been through them as well been through everything read every slip of paper in those boxes and let me point out the files were a mess uh it was like somebody had just thrown a bunch of random paper in box in bankers boxes that's what it's like but yeah i've been there read every word of it so says yeah sure they go down they 
unlocks the vault. He gives him this box. He goes up, stare. No, 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 no. I'm sure they brought the box to him. It was, and he looked at it probably in a break room, which is where I looked at it. Or I, I think I looked at it in, in Sandy Gibbons' office is where I looked at it. Or sits down, opens it up, and out falls a picture of Dr. George Hill Odell. He goes, whoa, he what? Steve always laughs here. Yeah. He's a suspect. He gets into it, and there's, you know, 800 pages of investigation. And he, he what? writes a couple. What? What? There are many, many. There are reams and reams of paper in there. A lot of it has to do... A lot of the black, a lot of the district attorney's files have to do with the Leslie Dillon debacle, which I will not get into now, except to say that there was this rogue investigation within the LAPD, not the homicide division. These other guys uh, investigated a guy named Leslie Dillon. Pew Eatwell wrote a book about it, um, and they they figured, oh, he he killed the Black Dahlia, and so uh, it it exploded, it blew up, uh, it was a fiasco. And the result of that was the grand jury uh, investigated uh, Leslie Dillon, the Leslie Dillon debacle. The bulk of that material, and there are reams of paper, the bulk of that deals with the Leslie Dillon investigation. There is not a heck of a lot aside from that. There's a few interviews that are useful. There's the bug of George Hodell's house, uh, but the bulk of it is the Les Leslie Dillon fiasco. There's lots and lots of testimony about that. A couple of articles. Um, short articles in his column. It says, well, Hodel wasn't... A... Including the comment from Larry Harnish where it's, you know, this is seeing the face of Jesus on a tortilla. Steve doesn't mention that. I wonder why. I wonder why Steve Hodel never, ever mentions that. What do you suppose? Was a suspect, blah, 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 and there are these transcripts. Yeah. So I get permission from Cooley to go down and look at him and copy the material, which I do. Spend six months reviewing it and be It doesn't take six months to review that, Steve. I went through it. I you know, I read it in um about a week or so. I mean, I it took me a week to process it because photocopying everything takes time. Um but I photocopied everything except for the morgue shots, which nobody was allowed to copy, and some of the crackpot mail. Uh, but everything else I copied, I have. I have read every piece of paper in those files. Basically, uh, put it all together, and, and what we discover is that... Your house was bugged. Yes, what we... No, it wasn't his house. The house was bugged. There were microphones in it. And Steve's going to say, this, this were, these weren't telephone taps. These were in the wall. Discover is that the, uh, actually the LAPD, the DA's office took it away. The grand jury took it away from LAPD and said, we want the DA's office to investigate it. No, that's utter bullshit. That is a absolute fucking lie. Harry Hansen and Finus Brown were the lead detectives on the Black Dahlia case. Harry Hansen was the lead detective on that case from the day he went to the crime scene until he retired in the 60s. The, nobody took the Black Dahlia case away from the LAPD. That is insane. Um, it is, Steve Hodell is preying on people's ignorance that they don't know how law enforcement works, that they don't know how the judicial system works, that they don't know how the legal system works. That doesn't happen. No, absolutely not. It's ridiculous. None of these crimes are being solved. Something's wrong here. DA, one of the white hats, Lieutenant Frank Jemison of the DA's office, jumps into it. He forms a task force of 18 detectives. What? He goes out. No. Ah. I don't think the district attorney had 18 detectives. Um, it was the um, the LAPD had a had a had a, had a surveillance team. Uh, they they put some bu they put some microphones in George Hodel's house. Uh, Frank Jemison did not take over the investigation of the Black Dahlia killing at all. That didn't happen. And he picks up George Hodel and he brings him in for questioning. And while he's got him at the office downtown, his men go out and they bug our home, this Mayan temple. 
You weren't living there, dude. You know what? Steve just trapped himself in a lie because he said, okay, they put the microphones in our home. Okay. How come you're not on the transcripts then, Steve? How come there isn't a single mention of you on those transcripts that were there for, what is it, five and a half weeks? You're not there. There's absolutely no children heard on those recordings anywhere. So I say, bullshit. You just caught yourself in a lie. Now, is Alan Campbell smart enough to catch him on that? I'm not optimistic. No, I'm not optimistic. Mm. On Franklin Avenue, and they put mm -hmm. not phone taps, but actual live in the wall, in the, in the wall, walls. in the wall, in the wall. And yes, right. What you know, and there are a lot of descriptions of George Hodel using the bathroom. A lot of commentary about George Hodel's use of the bathroom. They will spend the next um, six weeks listening 24/7, 18 detectives around the clock. And let, Steve, let me ask you about a particular uh, time, which is the 19th of February, 1950, when they hear a scream of a woman repeatedly. Oh, yeah. Yep. Woman screams, banging is heard, more screams. Uh, Steve's going to say this was a, a murder that was, you know, caught on a recording. Uh, okay. Let's see if Alan Campbell is going to follow up with any salient questions. I'm guessing no. I'm guessing Alan, Dr. Alan Campbell is just gonna buy this load of bullshit. Let's see. I mean, that, that really is, is kind of the, the key pinnacle thing. Um, it is. Tell us about that. Okay, well, oh, great. Uh, on that same date, actually on the, on the, 18th, uh, on the 18th of February, 1950, Dad's talking with a, an, a Baron Haringa uh, in conversation, mm -hmm. and and he basically confesses to the Black Dahlia murder. No, he doesn't. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Only in Steve World is that a confession. Uh, George Hodel was not a stupid man. He did have a high IQ. He was smart. He knew he was bugged. He knew he was under surveillance, and so he said a lot of inflammatory things. Uh, to see if he could get the cops to react. And that's all that happened. Like, like getting a, needling him about the Black Dahlia case. That's all that was. And uh, says, uh, supposing I did kill a Black Dahlia, they can't prove it now, my secretary is dead. Oh, and, and, and Steve is gonna say, yeah, he was suspected of killing his secretary, which of course is more Steve Hodel bullshit. Uh, the secretary named Ruth Balding, committed suicide, suicide. Um, Steve will somehow say, oh, he forced her to commit suicide. I was like, how do you do that? You know, you ever tried to give a pill to a cat? <laughs> you know, really, you know, forced her, to, forced her to take all these barbiturates? No, man. He then goes on to talk about uh, overdosing a secretary. And then... You can't do that. Really, I mean, have you ever tried giving a pill to a cat? You know, come on, it's just ludicrous. Dr. Alan Campbell is gonna just, yeah, okay, yeah, fine. He, he, he suicided his, his secretary. It's a lot more he talks about ab performing abortions. And also. Nah, he didn't, you know, George Hodel was against abortion. Sorts of stuff, so they, so they get this, then later on, I couldn't believe this, I'm reading the transcripts and they ran a hard wire from the Franklin House. To the Hollywood Station where I worked, who knew? It's Mayan Temple, to Hollywood Station. And the detectives are sitting in the basement of Hollywood Station. What, what's the distance seven. between the, the Mayan About House and the By the way, you say the Mayan House. Frank Lloyd Wright Jr. designed your house. The Lloyd Wright. That's right, it's known as the Soden House. It, it wasn't his house, he didn't live there. Except, you know, in ex ex moments of extreme desperation when Dorothy uh, couldn't find anywhere else to live. It's a historic monument, and set on yes. Hollywood set. But yes, okay. Frank Lloyd Wright Jr., Lloyd Wright, actually designed it. He was good friends with my father, and your father was good friends with it. Yeah, maybe not, because Lloyd Wright designed that house many years earlier, and uh, 
George Hodel didn't own that house. It was George Hodel Sr. Let me say again, George Hodel Jr., Steve's dad, rented. That house was a rental. It had been rented out for years. That's the real story. Everybody seemingly. I mean, you had an amazing. Uh... Yeah. Your mum and dad threw cocktail parties for Hollywood. Uh, uh, yeah. This cavalcade and parade of persons in and out of your home. Going back to the line now, so it goes from your house, a hard wire line to. It's a hard wire. It goes to the Hollywood division. Detectives are listening in the basement. The police station what 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 was well, the distance well it's about three miles but it's actually it went to the telephone lines it, so uh -huh. just up to the telephone lines and they use those so it's not like they ran one line yes. three miles okay they, they just connected it to the telephone and then they connected it at the other end from the telephone lines to the basement so his sexual activities heard uh banal uh, conversations heard and then these uh certainly incriminate a pipe is hit a woman screams. More pipe hitting, more screaming. Hating facets are, are revealed. Right. Why isn't there more of a pursuit? Why, why did they just let it go? Because they're not stupid, that's why. They were actually following department policy on stakeouts. If something happens that's not related to the goal of the stakeout, you're supposed to ignore it. It's in the LAPD training manual. It's online. Ignore it. Well, so they're sitting there listening to the conversation, and they and I'm reading the transcript, and they say George and the Baron Aringa and Hodel go downstairs to the basement. An object is heard striking. A woman screams. More blows. A woman screams again, and then it goes silent. And I'm reading this, and I'm fine. Yeah, they're baiting the cops because what happens a half an hour later? George Hodel is typing. Thinking, what the hell? Why aren't they out the door? It's six, five minutes away and uh, doing a rescue. They do. Because they're not stupid. That's why. Nothing. Yeah. OK. OK. This is a murder supposedly happening in George Hodel's basement. OK, fine. Who is the victim? What's her name? What did they do with the body? Where did she go? Didn't anyone notice that she was missing? I mean, Steve has just dumped this, okay, this murder happens on a recording and they listen, they don't do anything. Okay, who the hell is she? What do they do with the body? Why is George Hodel 30 minutes later typing? See, it's all bullshit. It is more Steve Hodel bullshit and nobody will challenge him. No one will say, okay, Steve, I say, Steve, who was this lady anyway who was killed with beating on the head? I say. So the detectives either, I don't know, you know, I can't answer why they didn't. But all I can. They weren't stupid. That's why they were following policy. Steve, how were you ever a cop? Were you ever on a stakeout? Were you? We know they didn't. And they would go on for another six weeks to. So this was either a serious felony assault or more likely a murder. I'm convinced it's a murder. Because... Yes, you're convinced of a murder because you want it to be a murder because shake that moneymaker. Who's the victim? Who is she? If this was a murder, who the hell is she and where is the body? Somebody must have noticed that this woman was missing and disappeared into thin air. Hmm? So George Hodel could go back to typing that evening? As we hear George on the transcript say, you know, don't leave a trace of anything to the Baron. You surely must have thought this through and through and through. You're an intelligent man. Uh, you are, uh, like your daddy, a man with a perceptive intellect. What possible notions do you have as for why they may not have pursued this? Were they were waiting for a bigger catch later on to encrypt? They didn't know what to do. Oh, my gosh. Should we call a lieutenant? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. You know, the LAPD had protocols in place for stakeouts and it covered situations like this. They followed, they followed department policy is what happened. Eliminate him or, or what, do you, what do you think might have been the reason? Well, I think possibly that these two detectives are, it's the third day of the stakeout, okay? Mm -hmm. They've just started it. And I think they probably looked at each other and thinking, what the hell's going on? Well, they knew he had a record for kinky sex and stuff. Mm -hmm. 
and they're thinking, well, maybe the, maybe it's just sex. It's you know, it, it was maybe he's just yanking their chain, you know. Maybe he's just yanking their chain. You ever think of that? They thought of that. It's very short. And I think, well, maybe you know, it's, quiet now. Or it's quiet now, you know, yeah. and maybe they tried to phone Lieutenant Jemison and he wasn't available or whatever. What do we do? You know, right. we don't want to blow the stake out. You know, it's only day three. So I think either that actually is right. We don't we don't want to blow the stake out. That was actually that actually is. Yeah. Yeah. And again, who's the victim? Who is this woman that was killed? Well, well, nobody ever asked that. Okay, who is she? Where's the body? What happened? Where? Why aren't there the usual activities of after you murder somebody disposing of the body? Why isn't any of that there? Hmm? For that or, you know, the, the worst thing, of course, would be that they had more knowledge and they were covering it up. But I, I suspect it was just... Uh, you know, well, let's, you know, what do we do? We don't want to blow this right. kind of thing. So kind of like and, let it ride and see where it goes. Right. They were following department policy. That's all. Don't blow the cover up. Steve actually got it right and then just zipped on over it. And Dr. Alan Campbell, um, softball questioner that he is, uh, isn't going to go there. Yeah. And, and you've got to also understand the timing of it. It's, it's 1950. Uh, William Parker, who is our greatest police chief, is just about to take over command. Yeah, this is the whole thing. We're not going to talk about, you know, we're not going to do anything about it. And we'll get back to it later and all that kind of stuff. And let me point out that when Parker became chief, he uh, established a unit to look at big uh, homicides. Mm. Okay. Mm. And he's, he's uh, about to assume chief. He's going to clean up Dodge. He's going to get rid of all the corruption. And, and this is the standard Steve Hodel crap about how the LAPD was corrupt and everybody was on the take. And it's like, no, that is not true. That's what people want to believe. It isn't true uh, at all. Um, the LAPD certainly had its problems, especially if you were a person, pardon me, especially if you were a person of color. But in terms of being corrupt and on the take and all that stuff, nah, no. That's that's totally wrong. That that's film noir crapola. Not true. No. Turn the department around. So which politics does, are involved. No, 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 no. Um, Parker's predecessor was a Marine general, uh, and he came in and did a big internal affairs investigation and discovered, yeah, there's a few bad apples, but basically it's a pretty good department, and that was really what got turned over to William Parker. Uh, it wasn't like William Parker suddenly cleaned everything up. No, that's not how it worked. That's not how it played out at all. Yes. Which he does. Yeah. Dad is probably, uh, the way I see it is dad has just fled the country shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. No, he didn't flee the country. Let me point out that Hawaii was an American territory. And if the LAPD had wanted to extradite him, they sure as hell could. Um, he went to Hawaii for the simple reason that that's the only place he could get a job. And the, LA, the, the police were done with him. They investigated him. They bugged the house. They interviewed lots of people. Everything pointed to him not being a suspect, not killing Elizabeth Short. No connection between George Hodel and Elizabeth Short at all. It's just Steve World craziness. And uh, they probably had burned the midnight oil at City Hall and said, look, He's out of the country. Maybe we can get him back. Maybe we can't. Let's just walk this away for now. Let's do what we have to do and clean up Dodge and come back to this at some future. Dodge was clean. It's ridiculous. It's your time. It, it seems very feasible and makes sense. It, it, it really yeah. does. Now, yeah. regarding... No, it is not feasible, Dr. Alan Campbell. It is not feasible at all. This is utter bullshit. Are you familiar with bullshit? Dr. Alan Campbell, because you're hearing a lot of it right now. In your dad's departure, uh, how did your mother Dorothy handle that? And Is Steve going to say that my parents were estranged and I was living with my mom and she was a drunk? Is he going to say any of that? 
and how did she address it to you as children and even later in, in decades to come? What was your mother's opinion? Oh. Mom thought she would have another drink as what mom did. Of your father, George. So, uh, first of all, when the, when the stuff hit the fan in regards to the incest arrest, we're immediately put in military school. And how old was your sister at the time this incident took place? They were put in military school. Hmm, interesting. That must have been because uh, Dorothy was an unfit mother. Uh, and so they put the, they, they needed some place to put the kids. And I will fault George Hodel uh, for one thing at a minimum. He didn't get custody of Steve and his brothers from mom the drunk. And I will fault George Hodel on that. He screwed up. He should have stepped up to the plate. I got these three boys. I need to raise them. And that's what he should have done. He did not do that. He screwed up. And, you know, to me, that's his biggest fault. Uh, we, and it's not a minor thing. But he didn't kill anybody. None of this other stuff. He was he was a uh, not a good dad. You know, he should have gotten custody of Steve and his brothers. He should have definitely. 14. Wow. Yeah. I was eight or nine, she was 14. And uh, so, you know, we wouldn't know that she there was a trial or anything until much later. Yeah, because you weren't living there. <laughs> you weren't living at the Satin House, you weren't living with your dad, none of that was happening. And uh, uh, basically, and the other thing that bothered me, I thought, well, how could there, how could a murder, when I got into it as an investigator, there's no way, you know, with us there, he's going to commit a murder. Well, I find out from the DA files that it's written that we're all gone. They... Yeah, you're gone, all right. <laughs> you're all gone because your folks had split up and you weren't living there. That's what happened. They interviewed mom and basically she stonewalled them, said she knew nothing about the crime. Uh, they would also indicate in the files that dad knew and dated Elizabeth Short. Not true. Yeah, let me point out, they did interview Dorothy Hodel. At the time of the interview, she was living on a bait, she was living over a bait shack on Santa Monica Pier. What did she say? She said, George Hodel was a fine physician. He could have had a lucrative practice if he wanted to. He didn't, he wanted to help people. Uh, didn't know Elizabeth Short, never killed anybody. Um, she absolutely stood up for George, which maybe the ex-wife wouldn't be inclined to do that, but she did. So she gave him a glowing reference, uh, which you're not going to get from Steve. But that's what that's what Steve's mom did. That is the reality. So there's a, a big question. You know, a lot of people say, well, okay, so this is amazing now. So, okay, so, Wait, so let me run that back. Basically, she stole, well, how could there, how could a murderer look? When I got into it as an investigator, there's no way, you know, with us there, he's going to commit a murder. Well, I find out from the DA files that it's written that we're all gone. They, they interviewed mom. That is not there. Them all being gone in the DA, that's not in the DA's files. That's utter bullshit. Um, Steve is relying on people's ignorance that they haven't seen the files and won't know that. But that's utter bullshit. And basically, she stonewalled them, said she knew nothing about the crime. Uh, they would also indicate in the files that dad knew and dated Elizabeth Short. No, no, there is one, there's one woman, her name's Lillian Lenorak. She ended up getting committed to the mental institution in Camarillo and ended up dying in a really bad way. Um, she was kind of crazy. Um, and I think she said that, but she said a, she was a really uh, unreliable witness and she said a lot of goofy stuff. So other than that, it's 100% all the people they interviewed, and they interviewed numerous people. All of them said, no, he didn't know Elizabeth Short. No, he didn't kill anybody. So there's a, a big question. You know, a lot of people say, well, okay, a photograph. So this is amazing now. So, okay, so, so it's, it's, there was evidence that your dad also had somewhat of a relationship with Elizabeth Short. No, there isn't any. Why do you believe him? Why do you believe him? Why don't you press him on that? Why don't you say, who says so? Who said that? The Black Dahlia. Oh, absolutely. And this is Dahlia. Okay, so it wasn't know. just some woman he randomly found and, and attacked. No, he, no. He had 
we no, some this kind goes of way intimacy. Back tonight. Actually, they started dating in '43 and '4. No, <laughs> no, this is no, 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 no. None of this happened. This is all Steve World fantasy. '44. Wow. And and he was connected with her. I mean that you know one of the big questions my readers say is well I'm and just some woman he randomly found and an attack. Oh no, no. He had. We no, this some goes kind of way intimacy. back. Tonight. Actually, they started dating in '43 and '44. No, that's utter bullshit. That didn't happen. Um, Elizabeth Shore was, I think, um, she was in LA very briefly, and then went up to Camp Cook and got sent back to uh, the Boston area. But I'm not sure she was even in Los Angeles at that time. They certainly were not dating. No, that is utter Steve World fantasy and. It, figuring people are too uh, trusting to actually challenge him on that. But that's utter bullshit. No, none of that's true. No, absolutely not. Wow. And, and he was connected with her. I mean, that, you know, the, one of the big questions my readers say is, well, I'm not convinced that photo is her. Yeah, you think? You know, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. so it, it no longer matters whether that. It doesn't. The photo is her. It doesn't matter if it's her. German facial recognition software says it's her, but it doesn't matter, but it's her. Photo oh, it's her or not. DA reports indicate that they right. were dating and were. No, only in the fantasy of Steve World. Uh, I have read the DA files. That's not what it says. Uh, George Hodel was eliminated as, as a suspect after five and a half weeks of surveillance. You will never ever hear that from Steve because why? Shake that money maker. Acquainted. Let me just ask you, because I'm sure listeners are thinking the same thing. It, was there any similarity in look between Elizabeth Short and your mother, Dorothy? Because sometimes men who are serial killers will have a particular type. Sometimes they don't. But was there a similarity between them? Well, I mean, in the sense that they were both attractive and brunettes, uh, but very general, I would say. And he was all over the map on his victims. The real crimes. Yeah. George Hodel was a killing machine, man. He killed everybody, all different, you know, uh, men, women, children, um, I don't know, dogs and cats, <laughs> you know, I mean, God. In Steve world, in the parallel reality of Steve Hodel world, anything is possible. Signature, which we're, unfortunately, I don't think we're gonna have time to discuss. Yeah, the signature is, I say that's it. That's 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 George Hodel's signature. Steve Hodel says, "Oh yeah, that's it." <laughs> is is fascinating, and to me, it's the most interesting part of the whole story. Well, you, 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 what are you tantalizing? You've got to tell us what, what is that? It, it's the it's the thought print. It it is the thought print. It's the clue. Uh, it is Steve recognizing his dad's handwriting. Uh, it is just whatever Steve pulls out of his nose. Well, I'm going to tell you, it's, it's uh, murder is a fine art. Was the key to crime signature that he had. And it has to do with surrealism and his friendship with Man Ray. And it involves other surrealist artists of that time, uh, Marcel Duchamp, uh, William Copley. Did he know Salvador uh, Dali? Oh, I'm sure he knew Dali because- Oh, he knew everybody. George Hodel knew everybody. Um, and he killed lots and lots of people. And they all knew that he killed lots and lots of people. He was just sort of the staff, uh, you know, Oh, George the Killer. Yeah, they all knew it. Dolly had, uh, uh, was making the Spellbound film, and actually some of Dad's crime signatures are taken from Spellbound, the movie. Right. What? Oh, Steve just makes my head hurt. Uh, no. God, it's just loony. I mean, it, it, it's, it's did, amazing. Did, did, the, um, did he encounter um, Hitchcock? Uh, I don't know about Hitchcock. Oh, he knew everybody. Certainly not, right? He knew everybody. George Hodel knew everybody. He probably had uh, tea, and, tea and scones with uh, with Hitchcock, I'm sure, Dr. Campbell. And, and I, ex I probably met Duchamp, too, because Duchamp and, and uh, Man Ray were very close. For met Marcel Duchamp? Okay. Friends. Right. And uh, so, but 
but they all in their own ways later on they were all aware of his crime and they actually did artwork in homage to George Odell. See, this whole posing of the body. No, 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 no. Steve Hodell has gotten to the point where he sees little Hodells everywhere. Uh, here's he, 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 hidden in every painting. There's a, a, a Hodell. This says Hodell. That says Hodell. It's written here. It's written there. It's all homage. I mean, you know, I mean, you can do that with uh, almost any painting. You can do it with a Mark, Mark Rothko painting. You can find a Hodell if you know how to do it. It's just Steve World nuttiness. And, and what he did to the body was his own surreal masterpiece. Was it appreciative homage for what your dad had done? or what? Is there any unappreciative homage? Dr. Alan Campbell? Hmm? Was it macabre fascination? Well, it could have been both, but I, I think it was appreciative because that was a whole movement back then. And yes, they, we, we love murderers. We want to glorify them, sure. Very dark and very misogynistic. You know, most of Man Ray's works you'll see are cut up, women cut up, women bisected. And Dad... Yeah, I'm not sure man ray hated women i i don't pick up on that i think i think man ray really pushed the boundaries of photography in very interesting ways i don't i don't get the impression that he hated women that is not what i get from those from his artwork at all actually paid homage to man ray by replicating a couple of his surrealist his photographs this is starting to sound like a Stanley Kubrick film. I mean, it's... it's it, well, it is. It's, sta mean, it's starting to sound like, you know, 10 tons of utter bullshit, Dr. Alan Campbell. It is, it, it is. I mean, this is the key that really sets this apart from, and really sets Dad's crimes apart from anything else, is these. And it's not just one or two. It's I'm, I'm now up to about 15 different links, to uh, very definite links that tie in. Yeah, Steve's case is so flimsy and weak and ridiculous that he keeps finding more clues. He is driven. He has to find more clues. He has to find more proof because his case is utter bullshit. And, and rather than admit that, he keeps having to find more and more clues. Why? Because shake that moneymaker into this. And uh, there's a whole other aspect that where he's posing the bodies near street signs as a, ta a taunting clue. Oh, yeah, yeah. The whole map torture thing, which is utterly ridiculous. Not true. You described murder as being a fine art. What do you mean by that? Uh, murder is a fine art. It's a fine art. It's, it's, it's a fine art. It's art and it's fine. That's what it is, Dr. Alan Campbell. Well, uh, basically, you know, Dad was into... Poe, as a, you know, as a young man, he was he was really over the edge in a lot of stuff. He, his heroes were Poe and De Quincey, Thomas De Quincey, Baudelaire, and and all of the you know the, the poets and the writers of of that time before his time too. And basically, uh, De Quincey uh, wrote a wrote an essay called "Murder is a Fine Art," and it was published in um, your English paper, Blackwoods, is it, magazine, mm -hmm. uh, at the, way back at the turn of the century. And it was a story of basically uh, this, these connoisseurs of murder who would meet a, and discuss uh, that murder should be considered as... What are we doing here? You know, um, that's not, that is not, you know, I mean... It, no. Fine art means in Steve Hodel world that's that's mutilating a body so that as because it is a canvas. Uh, it is not um, detectives meeting. It, it's sort of like the Vidoc Society, you know, to, to discuss crime. Totally different. It's one of the fine arts. Why are we having music here? Why are we having music? What is this for? This is Watching America on WHRV. Oh, we'll no. We'll be right back. Today's conversation. The serial murderer of various ladies and...
Yeah, I, I fast forwarded through this. Serial murder of ladies. In particular, Elizabeth Short, a yeah. 22 year old aspiring actress who on the 15th of January 1947 was found uh, mutilated and uh, left abandoned in an empty lot. I'm, I'm going to ask an unusual question, Steve, and, and we have a very. Let's see if it's an unusual question. I'll bet it's the same old question. Let's see sophisticated audience and you oh. are a sophisticated gentleman so I'm, I'm sure you're going to understand how I mean it's not in a menacing or accusatory way sure but you speak of murder being a fine art as grisly and um, as as distasteful as it is and yet the there is perhaps a part of you that might because you are his son uh, have not an appreciation for murder but perhaps a, a strange understanding uh, for him being so thorough, shall we say, as he huh? has been in so many other ventures in his life uh, with murder. I mean, and did you sense that getting to know the man? In a sense, you were getting to know your father all over again. That's exactly right. I knew very little about him, and he was a, a man behind the Yeah, my father and I were very close, but I didn't know him. Let's go back and listen to that question again. So thorough, shall we say as he has been in so many other ventures in his life but because you are his son uh, have not an appreciation for murder but perhaps a, a strange understanding uh, for him being so thorough shall we say as he has been in so many other ventures in his life uh, with murder i mean and did you sense that getting to know the man in a sense you were getting to know your father all over again that's exactly right i think well, it's an unusual question. It's kind of a strange question. Let's see how Steve is going to answer this thing. Um, is he asking Steve that he's an aficionado of murder or that he, uh, his dad was an aficionado of murder or he understands his dad better? I don't know. I knew very little about him and he was a, a man behind an iron mask, very secretive his whole life, even though I was I would see him through the decades and, and visit him, but it was always, there was a distance. He wasn't your typical warm, fuzzy father. He no, evidently. Yeah. He wasn't much of a dad. That's true. Maybe he was more in the Philippines um, because the Philippine side of the family has kind of warm memories of George Hodel. Uh, the American except for Duncan. Duncan seemed to feel pretty positively toward George Hodel, um, but maybe not some of the other kids, you know. Oh. You know, but he was he was cold and and and, but, but, and remote, but 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 in the last decade when he returned, uh, we became, you know, he wasn't capable of, you know, what what I would call a father-son love, but he mm. was capable of at least he was, you know, he had warmed up a bit and we became in my view kind of quite close. He was remote, but we were close, but he didn't ever warmed up. What in the fuck is that? Wow. Have respect for him. Tremendous respect for his abilities. So um, ultimately, you know, I had no idea of these crime signatures. I had no idea that until I really got into the weeds of it and I got into studying Man Ray and, and all of our Man Ray, you know, we had about 15 different photos from Man Ray of our family photos and stuff. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. I don't think Man Ray was doing Olin Mills. Um, that is not, that was not the kind of work he was doing. Don't think so. Mm -hmm. And then I started looking at Man Ray and his artwork, and um, then I started realizing what Dad had done. Uh, the posing of the Black Dahlia's body cut in half was in imitation of a famous photograph by Man Ray called the Minotaur. No, it's not. No, no, that is, Steve seized on that. Steve was flipping through a book of uh, Man Ray photographs and saw this thing and like, oh, that's gotta be it. Because that's how Steve Hodel does research. Uh, he didn't look at the, the picture. He didn't look at the history of the photograph. He just said, oh, that's it. And, you know, Man Ray is, you know, in, po in the popular mind, people who don't know, he's just sort of this weird photographer who does strange picture so like well, okay um damn in reality that photograph was ran in a it was ran with the index of um 
an art magazine called Minotaur. And that's the only place it was ever published until it was, I guess, uh, collected in an anthology of Man Ray's uh, photographs. Whether George Hodel could have ever seen that photograph um, is an open question. But of course, in Steve World, oh yeah, slam dunk, that's, that's got to be it. Because that's how Steve Hodel does his research. Which was, you know, the Minotaur was locked on the island of Crete, was half beast, uh, half bull, and uh, devoured maidens. They fed it maidens. And there now, was was maiden. Do you suppose there was this kind of peculiar homage going on between Man Ray and your father back and forth? I mean, do you think both... Yeah, Steve thinks that, you know, Man Ray would do a picture and then George Hadell would do a murder and then Man Ray would do a picture in homage to George Hodel, and George Hodel would do another murder. That's what Steve thinks. I guess Steve thinks that. So the bodies were just piling up. Parties were conscious of it. Oh, absolutely. There's no question about it. Um, uh, and it's the, 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 there's a um, Man Ray and, and uh, Copley, William Copley, who was another surrealist artist from that time period, were well, during their Hollywood years, were regular visitors to the what I call the Franklin House. This, yeah, I'm not sure that's documented either. Uh, Steve does a lot of things that he wants to be suddenly are true. Um, that's yeah, maybe. By a temple, uh, Lloyd Wright's mm -hmm. the home, and uh, they were regular visitors, and and um, Elizabeth. Well, Steve, did you ever meet Man Ray when you were living at the Southern House? Hmm? Hmm? Did you? Oh, that's right. He took pic Man Ray took pictures of Steve and his brothers. Did anybody ask what was Man Ray like? What was you know? Do you remember posing for those pictures? Nobody ever asks him that. They just let him lie. The sort actually posed for Man Ray one of Man Ray's paintings in '43. No, that is utterly untrue. That is utter, utter. Steve Hodel bullshit. There is no connection whatsoever between Elizabeth Short and Man Ray. And there is absolutely no connection between Elizabeth Short and George Hodel. Elizabeth Short certainly, most certainly did not pose for Man Ray ever. It's just ridiculous. Will Dr. Alan Campbell say, oh, I say, Steve, how do you know that? No. It's called Lee Equivocay. And wow. Yeah, wow. and, it's and a very small world. These, these, it's these. A, very... a little skepticism, Dr. Alan Campbell, would be utile, I think. A small is... world, but but yeah. I think either George introduced her, her to him, or Henry introduced her to him. He... No, that didn't happen. That is Steve Hodel fantasy. None of that's true. None of that ever happened. No. To George, I don't know which way it was. What was amazing was that well, it, it, it didn't happen at all. No. This drawing, there's a, a geometrical figure instead of a face. Well, that is called cross hatching, Steve. And it is an old, old art technique. It's been around forever. It is a fundamental art technique. It's not a geometric figure. It has a name. It's called cross hatching. Dad, in his in his torture and, and murder of Elizabeth Short, carves this same geometrical figure on her right. It's called cross hatching. I guess Steve never took an art appreciation course, or he would know that. He'd hip. So again, that's not only is it the Minotaur, but he carves this very unique geometrical on her right. There's nothing unique about it. It's cross hatching. It's crisscrossing. It's an elementary technique that has been around forever. Yep, again, in homage to Matt No, Ray. no. And after the fact, of course, I'm not saying that the, all of these surrealists were involved in the actual crime. I, I don't think they were. Yes, you do. You want, you, you want the surrealists to all be murder bros uh, with George Hodel. But certainly they were aware immediately afterwards. Marcel Duchamp, one of his most famous works is Etat Donné which is a woman's body posed in a lot, a nude body posed in a lot with her arms up and stuff, which has been on. Yeah, the Marcel Duchamp stuff is new to me. I, you know, I mean, 
Steve usually beats the drum on Man Ray pretty hard, but uh, Duchamp is that, you know, I don't recall him going going there. Um, I don't know. This play for decades at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Uh, and then there's, there's others. Copley did one that's called It's Midnight, Dr. Blank, and it's a woman and it's a surgeon. Oh, yeah. And Steve has found Hodel spelled out in the painting uh, again. You can find it. If you know how Steve does it, you can find a Hodel in almost any artwork, except for Jackson Pollock. Maybe that would be a challenge. Uh, but you can do it with Mark Rothko. You could do it with Mo the Mona Lisa. I mean, it, 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 when you know how Steve Hodel finds these little Hodels written in paintings, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Every painting, you can do it. A man standing there and a surgeon uh, clearly a surgeon with a surgeon tools and there's a nude body below him and he's he's about to bisect uh, bisect the body so that was Copley's homage to George and then Fred Sexton another friend of his did another one so uh, I mean it, it all comes together in in this incredible <laughs> it all comes together in this incredible shake that money maker And shake that money maker too. And most shake that money maker. Yeah. Okay. As I say, murder is a fine art. Sick crime signature. I want to ask you, Steve, um, and for those of us just being. I want to ask you, Steve, what is your fucking problem? Do you have a problem with your father, perhaps? Hmm? Uh, joined to the program right now. You're listening to Watching America, and I'm speaking to Steve Hodell, who is the author of many books, the first of which was Black Dahlia Avenger. Shake the Money Maker. And his most recent book, incidentally, is called In the Mesquite. In the, in the Weeds. Which we'll talk about in a moment. Solving the 1938 West Texas kidnap torture case, and that is the murders of Hazel and Nancy. You know, I thought this I thought this recording was from tw from 2013, but it isn't. So I don't know when the hell it was done. If he's talking about in the weeds, uh, that was published in 2019. So I don't know. Um, this isn't exactly dated, so I don't know. It's weird. See from, but getting back to the Black Dahlia and your father um, being the perpetrator, believed to be of of these heinous. Steve thinks he. Steve thinks his dad did it. Nobody else does. Well, except for the people he stooped. Crimes, murders. I want to ask you about the discovery of evil being so close to you. You see, I'm always conscious of the fact that people sometimes have a macabre fascination with murder and death and, and all sorts of mayhem because they can afford to have it and it hasn't actually touched them. Uh, I've actually known somebody who's been murdered. Oh, And um, when it gets closer, it's, it's, it's less fascinating because it then appears to be a reality. Having been close to him, Steve, and you discovered these things with great certitude, without doubt, mm -hmm. did you cry? Did you feel duped? Did you feel anger? How did you I've, handle I've it emotionally? Every, Alan, I've been through every possible emotion you can think of. Uh, uh, and, and ultimately, I came to came to see him as a Jekyll, as a real life Jekyll and Hyde. And I always thought that was an interesting, you know, uh, novel, but, but no real truth to it. Well, he proved me wrong. Mm. Uh, and the truth is, I love the Dr. Jekyll, the good part of him that was. Yeah, I don't really know how that would work. You know, Steve does say that. He does tell people that, you know, yeah, I love my father. Yeah, he was killing all these people and jetting around the world, murdering folks. But I still loved him. But, you know, yeah, he was, you know. I don't know. It's strange. It's really strange. I tell you what it is. It's sad. If if Steve didn't just tromp all over everybody, uh, pushing his crazy ideas, um, I would feel sad for him. I would feel sorry for him just being at this point so deluded with these crazy fantasies that are easily disproved. But you know, he has harmed a lot of people along the way. Um, Elizabeth Short's family, members of the Hodel family. He just doesn't give a rip who he steps on. 
with his cra these crazy ideas. The families of, um, we haven't gotten into that, the families of the uh, Thad Brown and, and William Parker, the people he accuses of uh, corruption and cover-ups. You know, all that stuff, you know, he doesn't care. You know, it's just, um, it's, it's this Steve Hodel fantasy. It's sad, it, as I said. Um, I would feel sorry for him if he hadn't harmed all these other people, stepping all over him with his crazy ideas. Brilliant and could have done anything, could have cured cancer, could have, you know, had, and I grew to hate the Mr. Hyde, that monster within him, and which was the stronger creature. And uh, to this day, I've, I've been through every possible emotion you can think of, and now I'm just, I'm left with a terrible sadness, you know, uh, just, and I'd like big whiny self-promoting uh, true crime author trying to sell shake that money maker it's all it's about shake that money maker I tried to look a lot of the triggers that caused him and I've looked at a lot of them and I, 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 I you know you kind of have to understand his background his mother was uh, and father were Russian Jews. They went to Paris, and uh, she became a dentist in 1901. Paris. Oh uh, God, we're going to go into. And they came through. We're we're going to go into more of the remarkable. See, this is what Steve does, and the, and the interviewers, you know, just Steve will just <laughs> zip off into uh, boilerplate, and you know, the interviewers just let him ramble. Nobody, you know. Alan Campbell, you were not a good interviewer. You let Steve wander all over the place. Just let him talk. Los Island came out to L.A. Very controlling mother. You know, he was uh, this young genius, and uh, he, he'd go to his mother and say, and this, this is a story from my mother. He'd go to his mother and say, Mom, can I go out and play baseball with the boys? And, you know, his mother would say, no, Georgie, you're... You're a pianist, not a baseball player. You'll hurt your hands. Yes. Very controlling. Right. I think she was. He was probably the victim of incest, either with her or. <sighs> yeah, I'm not sure any of that's true. Not sure any of that's true. You know, George being the the gifted child prodigy pianist is. That's a Steve fantasy, also, you know. No, the, the, you, you you go to check that story, and it just falls apart so quickly. But nobody ever does. Nobody ever fact checks Steve. No one. Some other family member, and uh, he was rejected because of his. He was so smart and advanced. He two or three grades ahead of everybody else. Uh, in some of his letters, as uh, that he's writing in, he mentions getting revenge for the high school girl that rejected him. We got six six minutes something left. Hang in there. I I can see that I can see the end from here. Uh, Steve is going to wind down eventually. He really will. So I'm sure there was a lot of peer rejection on his part. And, rage, um, rage perhaps. Rage and congenital insanity. I mean, there's a whole, you know, a whole well, bunch of things come together. Congenital insanity? Oh, I got to hear that again. Getting revenge for the high school girl that rejected him. So I'm sure there was a lot of peer rejection on his part. And, rage, um, rage perhaps. Rage and congenital insanity. I mean, the congenital insanity. It's a friend of the family, Steve. There's a whole, you know, a whole now, bunch of things come together. Looking at Steve Hodel today, uh, it is not surprising that you would have a literary career writing about... Um, have you read these fucking books? <laughs> They're terrible. The writing is very pedestrian. I mean, it, Steve Hodel, as in Shake That Moneymaker, he's boring, he's repetitive, he's dogmatic. He's a shitty writer. Um, you know, don't come after me with this. You know, he's a great stylist. No, nah, he isn't. He's not boring. Murders, which you've done. So um, you've written multiple books. Your latest being, of course. Your latest being, of course, uh, Beyond the Valley of the Black Dahlia Avenger and uh, Children's Haiku 
to Black Dahlia Avenger. And um, let's see, am I leaving out something? There's got to be some movie in there. Uh, Black Dahlia Avenger Beach, maybe? Monsters of Black Dahlia Avenger Beach? Could be. In the Mesquite, 2019, and solving the 1938 West Texas kidnap. Uh, solving air quotes there, Dr. Campbell. Uh, case. What was the fascination with writing the latest book very, very quickly? Well, yeah, well. well the fascination was shake that moneymaker. That's what the fascination is. Shake that moneymaker. Buy my books. Basically, all of these books are really just one book. It's an ongoing investigation and continuation of his crimes. You know, from forward, from 1940. Well, so are you saying your father was involved in the West Texas kidnap? Oh, yes. Oh, Dr. Alan Campbell. Yes, yes, yes. George Hodel didn't wake up one day and decide, oh, I think I'll be a serial killer. He was been a serial killer for years, years and years and years and years, and lots and lots and lots of killing all over. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, he was the killer. I hate to ruin the story, but that's okay. The, yes, the, when he was in. Dr. Alan Campbell. George Hodel killed everyone. Every unsolved murder on the planet, George Hodel. Even some of the solved murders were George Hodel. You thought they were solved? No, 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 no. It was George Hodel. George Hodel sank the Titanic. George Hodel blew up the Hindenburg. Yes, yes, yes. Awful man. He knew everyone. What he was doing his doctoring in New Mexico and uh, Arizona. This is a crime he, he committed there uh, during that time period. This occurred in 1938. He did crimes in other places. He did crimes in Chicago. He did crimes in Manila. So all of these books are all his crimes. Wow. And I keep finding more. More because shake the money maker. Dr. Alan Campbell, you are just enabling. You are just an enabler. Uh, by my books, Steve Hodel. Steve, you have said that, um, you know, obviously you, you're grief stricken by, by all of this in extreme. <laughs> <coughs> have you ever seen Steve Hodel? Do you think he's grief stricken? Mr. Buy my books, shake that money maker. Does he seem grief stricken to you? Because I don't think so. I've seen people who are grief stricken. That is not Steve Hodel. It's by my books. Sad by these events. Um, somebody uh, w with a lack of grace and kindness uh, might say, and I'm only voicing this so you can respond, might be inclined to say, well, okay, this is all well and good, but this man is profiting uh, from the deaths of all these people and recounting them. And in a sense, the the Black Dahlia Elizabeth Short is being exploited yet again by, by you writing of these accounts. What is your rebuttal to that? What, how do you... uh, 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 no, of course not. I, I, it's homage. It's honoring. It's uh, <laughs> by my books. You set the record straight. This has never been about money for me. And number one, by my books. I have about 15 bestsellers to make any money, any real money. That's true. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, believe me, I'm, I'm still in the hole on these, even though they've become a New York Times bestseller and stuff. Mm. I, it's not about money. It's about what is. Yeah, it's about money. Um, let me point out, because you will again. Well, you might hear this from Steve Hodel, that he blew his entire advance on shake that money maker to buy some Elizabeth Short photos on eBay. And he would have gotten away for, with it if I hadn't outed him. And the reason I outed him uh, is because I didn't want him to come along and say, see, here are these Elizabeth Short photos I found in my dad's stuff. So I outed him that he bought him on eBay and he'll never be able to claim that because that's the kind of guy Steve Hodel is. He will buy something on eBay and say he found it in his dad's stuff. Oh, he's lies about everything. All I've been about for me is I'm wired to search for the truth. And that <laughs> and run away from the truth as fast as possible. 
that's that's the truth of it. And um, uh, you know, I, I'm just uh, I, I want it's an important story. It it deals it's the real history of Los Angeles of Hollywood. No, it isn't. It's a fantasy world. What you have heard is just Steve Hodell spinning off crazy fantasies. Almost nothing he said was true. Almost nothing. Uh, these amazing, all of these crimes, and it's all about getting to the truth of it and get, get, giving some, you know, recompense to the victims. You know, um, sure. a lot of detectives will say it's BS, and it's not. It, it's a very real part of uh, the knowing who did it is is very important and we still don't know who did we know we know who didn't do it we know george hodell didn't kill anybody that's what we know we know his his son has got some very major problems with reality at this point is uh is a great aid to comforting the family mem extended family members well let me put it this way one thing Steve Hodell's books, like Shake That Money Maker, have not done has brought any comfort to the family of Elizabeth Short. As far as they are concerned, Steve Hodell is just out to cash in on their tragedy. His books, his claims bring absolutely zero closure to them. They just see him as a self-promoting shithead. And you can quote me, Steve Hodell, self-promoting shithead. Steve, a very difficult question, and perhaps the most uh, arduous and uh, challenging for you. Oh, it's going to be an arduous, challenging question for Detective 3 Steve Hodell. Bring it on, Dr. Alan Campbell, because so far I, you do not impress me. At the end here, what positive thing can we take away from these very dark occurrences that have transpired. Positive for society, positive for you, positive for your beloved deceased mother, your family. <laughs> your, your beloved deceased mother. <laughs> Is there any light at all that can be gleaned from these circumstances? Well, I, I think that uh, the light comes from knowing the truth of it. And The good thing about it is that we now know the truth of Steve Hodell's parallel reality. That is Steve Hodell's truth. It, it, it is this parallel reality. Uh, and that's all. One man, what you have heard is one man's delusion. That's what you've been hearing for the last hour. And, and I think that uh, knowing the truth as opposed to the you know, the, the, the uh, falsities that have been, I mean, there's so many myths about Elizabeth Short. Yeah. And again, um, one of the main sources of myths about Elizabeth Short is this guy right here, Steve Hodell. Totally fictionalized. He, he is public enemy number one when it comes to lying about Elizabeth Short. It's Steve Hodell, the lying cop. Uh, I, I couldn't believe it because, so. Uh... You know, I started, normally in a homicide investigation, you start out with a tabula rasa, a blank slate. And there were so many myths stacked on this, on her murder and, and suspects and all sorts of things. But I had to deconstruct all of those myths. Yes. I had to come up with the myth of Papa. Papa, the jet set murderer. He was falsely accused of being a prostitute, among other things. And, oh, and her friends absolutely. I spent a whole chapter, re, you know, rehabilitating her character. Little Steve fantasy rehab there. She was just basically a uh, attractive, naive uh, young woman looking to fall in love during the war with Miss Lieutenant Wright and live happily ever after. There was no, she was not a prostitute. She was. She did fall in love. She was engaged. Are you going to say that? Huh? She actually was engaged. She did fall in love. She was engaged to a guy. Killed at the end of the war. Not a druggie. So anyway, there was a, a great, gave me great pleasure in setting the record straight as far as the victim herself and, 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 and knowing, I mean, all of these crimes, you know, uh, setting the record straight to, 
truth is is my god if you will and, and uh, we've <laughs> the truth is my god <coughs> yeah how can you write a pile of lies like this and say truth is my god how how because this is all bullshit this is bullshit ah. and this is bullshit and yet have the balls to say truth is my god no it's not hell of a lot of truths uh from my investigation so that's been my reward on many graves is inscribed three words rest in peace yeah. and i presume perhaps even on the graves of some of his victims regarding all of this well, considering they didn't have any victims, how about the woman that he killed in the basement? We don't know where the body was and we don't know who she was or where she is or anything else. But, you know, does she rest in peace? Will you ever be able to rest in peace? No. You know why? because Steve Hodel is desperate for attention. He's desperate for publicity and he is desperate to sell his books. So Steve will keep finding clues and finding more murders until the day he dies. And that's when it'll stop. And not until then. I will because again, as, as hor horrific as the truth has been and the discoveries that I thought it was one of the worst monsters that ever walked the earth. No, not true. Not true. It's all made up. In Steve world, that may be true. But in reality, which is where we live, that is not true. Uh, knowing the truth of it and, and being able to present that uh, gives me an ability to, to rest in peace. Steve likes the attention. He's hooked on the attention. He's hooked, hooked on the adulation. He wants to do as many of these bullshit interviews as possible. So he will keep at it until the day he dies, for sure. I, you know, know, knowing those truths are very, very satisfying for me. That's why I loved homicide work so much. Solving the riddle, the mystery, the enigma was always part of my DNA. Steve Hodel, it has been extremely interesting speaking with you. I found you to be candid, direct, and telling perhaps dr alan campbell you are a terrible interviewer i let me say that and you let steve hodell ramble all over the place you didn't ask any hard questions at all it was very soft ball not cricket or maybe it is cricket i don't know it's one of the most chilling stories i have ever heard relayed and disturbing with complete candor unabashedly and um as you would say honoring the truth <laughs> these folks don't have a clue they think steve hodell is telling the truth he, that he's being honest they haven't a clue they haven't a clue how much he lies unbelievable for that all of us on this side of production and listening for those in the audience of watching america i thank you Take I care, thank sir. you dr campbell i appreciate that you're very welcome blessings bye okay well, that was, as I unfortunately expected, lots of softball questions, no skepticism at all. So, you know, another Steve Hodell interview is in the can. Um, lots of softball questions, a few things new, uh, not a lot, but it's always interesting. Again, I, you know, I thought the interview was from 2013, it's from 2019. I don't know. It's hard to tell. Um, but that's it. And if you got to the end, gold star. And with that, Larry Harnish is out. <laughs>